Let me turn now to a statement I think is, is powerful. These words were written more than a decade ago by University of Pennsylvania Native students in the United Minority Council, sponsored by the Greenfield Intercultural Center and the Chaplain's Office, in cooperation with the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania, and it is read each year by a Native graduate at baccalaureate. The words are fitting today. We are gathered here today on Lenape Hopi, land that once was and still is sacred to the Lenape people. It is here that the people called the grandfather tribe and the peacemakers have lived their lives, spoken their language, and held their ceremonies for thousands of years. In honor of them, let us pause in the Lenape way, remembering where we are and who we are with, to be of one mind and one heart with all our relations, to remember the ancestors and to walk softly and carefully on our mother earth and to give thanks to our creator. With these thoughts, all right action follows. Aho. So thank you everyone for joining us today um, and to the panelists for um, their time and labor in this work. Um, my name is Bonnie Waslick and I'm the Director of Inclusive Excellence at Penn State Abington and an Associate Professor of Education. Um, and my role here today is uh, to moderate this panel. So I'm gonna take a minute to read the biographies of these fantastic folks and starting with Ms. Jabor. Delilah Jabor is a senior at Penn State Abington pursuing her Bachelor of Arts in Investor Integrative Arts and a minor in Public History. As a member of the Schreier Honors College, she particularly has an interest in re researching the intersections in the fields of race, genders, sexualities, histories, and the arts. Ms. Jabor aims to further her career as an academic scholar by educating the public about on the realities of cultural societies, socio-historical backgrounds. She has a keen interest in discovering interactive ways to express uh, to the public how these influence citizens' livelihoods by utilizing art installation and public history exhibitions. Uh, and Dr. Ann DePis uh, is received her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She has taught university at the University of Pennsylvania, Widener University, at Penn State Abington, um, and Goddard College, teaching social sciences and Native American studies. She's the director of she is director of education and research for TK Wolf Inc., a 501c3 American Indian organization. Her work with natives in Oklahoma has directed much of her research as well as her presentations and publications. Her meetings with indigenous groups outside of the US have included those in Taiwan, in Northern um, peoples of Russia and those in Australia. She has served as chairperson for the committee on the UN Decla declared decade of indigenous peoples. She works with native students and alumni at the University of Pennsylvania and consults with Princeton in Asia um, in religious re for religious issues in countries where they have fellows. Dr. Stephanie Masta is a member of the uh, Salsate uh, Marie tribe of the Chippewa Indians. She's also an associate professor of curriculum studies with affiliate appointments in American studies in the cultural of liberal arts in the school of engineering in the education sorry, engineering education at Purdue. Much of her research focuses on the experiences of black and brown individuals in K-12 educational environments with particular interest in indigenous peoples and their relationship to academic spaces. Stephanie's work is also invested in uncovering the intersections of colonialism and race within the academy. Her research is narrative-based and she uses both indigenous methodologies and critical race slash decolonial theories in her work. Dr. Massa has received external funding from the National Science Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, and the Sloan Foundation. She has published in journals such as Anthropology and Education, Quarterly, the International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, the Journal of Philosophy and Theory in Education, and in, uh, Teaching Higher Education. In 2022, Dr. Massa was the recipient of the College of Education Graduate Faculty Mentoring Award. And finally, Dr. Sharon Holt, Dr. Holt earned her PhD in American history in 1991 from the University of Pennsylvania. Author of 
Making Freedom Pay, North Carolina, Freed People Working for Themselves, 1865 to 1900. She divided her career between academic teaching and public history, serving museums and historical organizations in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Maryland. She received her Emmy Award for her work as a historical commentator in the video series, Philadelphia, The Great, um, the Great Experiments, History Making Productions. In 2014, Dr. Holt joined Pennsylvania State University's Abington College, where she taught history and directed public history minor until her retirement in 2023. Thank you, Dr. Wazalek, for that introduction. And um, I would like to go briefly into a statement of a statement of um, inclusion. So Penn State is committed to fostering an equitable and anti-oppressive culture wherein diversity and inclusion of all identities and from all backgrounds feel welcome, supported, and encouraged to gain, to engage in a meaningful exchange of ideas. Participants at this event can expect to experience a safe, collaborative environment in which they are treated with dignity and respect. This requires a community free of discrimination, harassment, bullying, and intimidation. Behaviors that do not uphold the highest standards of integrity and professional ethics are not welcome at this event and will not be tolerated. Um, so, hello, I'm Delilah Jabor. Um, before I begin, I would like to make clear that the reason I began this research is because of personal connections with colonization that were inflicted on my family in the Middle East and more specifically Lebanon. However, the focus of the discussion today is on Native Americans and the atrocities that they have suffered due to colonization across the globe and, as it will be discussed today, across the Americas. Throughout this project, I have focused my attention and efforts towards Indigenous lives in the United States with the same passion and empathy as if they were my family from back home. As such, let us, in this discussion, pay attention to the issues that surround us in our day-to-day -day lives as we continue to live on these stolen lands. And while I did this research and went through the archives, I went through multiple segments of the Ogons archives, and these are in the Penn State Library at Abington campus, and these included the diaries of Abby A. Sutherland, the headmistress of the school, the newspaper known as the school, the, the mosaic, the physical examinations book, the school's curriculum and course lists, and external resources online and outside of the archives. Um, so we will, we will go into the background. Um, so the, the story of this school begins at the Chestnut Street Female Seminary, and this was a private girls' school that opened in 1850. Um, it primarily worked as a word-of-mouth network, um, and only students that had prominent recommendations from people in the area were able to attend. It was especially because the alumni that came from the school would survey a high list of applicants and only homogeneous and exclusive high status families would be accepted into the school. Um, and it was families of stereotypically good American lineage. While the school progressed and got in larger, they wanted to expand the size of the school because this school was in the middle of Center City, Philadelphia, and there wasn't a lot of space. Um, and this is when Jay Cook comes into the picture. So Jay Cook was a Civil War financier who financed the Union War effort during the American Civil War. Um, he rented the estate, his estate, the Ogons estate, to the Chestnut Street, main, to Chestnut Street Seminary for $15,000 a year starting in 1883. This went on until 19, well, he died in 1905, but uh, they stayed at this location until 1915 when a neighboring estate requested to purchase the Ogons estate. And as a result, Abby Sutherland, the headmistress at the time, decided to sell it. And she transfers over. This is when she buys the new estate, which is known as um, the Herring Estate. And this is what we see now as the Penn State Abington campus. So this was in 1916. Um, and it stayed there, and that, that was the location of the building um, until its ending in 1949, which is when Abby Sutherland was caught feigning the school as a nonprofit and was indebted with back taxes with the county. And she had to either get rid of the school or pay back all those taxes. Um, as a result, she donates the school to Penn State University because they were looking for more Commonwealth campuses at the time. And uh, Penn State allows her to stay living in what we know as the Lairs Building until she dies in 1961. 
um, when Penn State gets the school, they name it the Penn State Ogons Commonwealth Campus. Um, and they did this as a commemoration for the previous title as the Ogon School for Young Ladies. So, well, sorry one second. <laughs> um, so Penn State decides to change the name from Ogon to the Ogon's Abington in 1995. And this was to emphasize its relationship with the surrounding community. And then in 1997, uh, Penn State Ogons Abington changes to Penn State Abington as to the reason of not wanting to be mistaken as closer to Philadelphia. I want it to be noted that it was not for the false representation of indigeneity, but rather for preferred marketing tactics that would benefit Penn State University. This started to, you have to start questioning a little bit um, whether or not it had to do with the redlining. So redlining are zones that are deemed high risk um, areas which are systematic denial of mortgages, insurance, loans, and other types of financial services. Um, this is typically seen in inner city neighborhoods, such as places that have predominantly high Black immigrant and Jewish populations. Um, and looking at the redlining map from 1937, Ogons was particularly close to a red line, red line district. And you have to question whether or not Penn State did not want to be associated with a redlining district in the first place, and that may have been the reason why they changed the name, or part of the reason anyway. Um, so going into this history of the school. So we know the Ogons estate. We hear the name Ogons School for Young Ladies, and you question Ogons, right? So Ogons was a chief of presumably the Wyandotte tribe. Um, or the Ottawa tribe. There's not many known records that really state whether or not it was one or the other, um, because there's an equal amount uh, debating both. Um, what we do know is that he was really, really prominent during the War of 1812. The War of 1812 was a war that was fought by USA and its indigenous allies against the UK and their indigenous allies. Um, it was a, due to differences over territorial expansion um, in North America, and the British were supportive of Native American pushback of the U.S. colonial settlements. And it was known that, um, well, it was thought that Chief Ogans was fighting the war effort through, well, on the U.S. side. Um, and one thing that I found online is actually uh, the Ohio story, which you can see on here. It was a radio script um, that was hosted in 1949. And what was interesting about this was that it perpetuated the make-believe idea of, Amer of an American Indian rather than a Native American. Um, Chief Ogans was believed to be a missionary and an innocent bystander of the savage nature of fellow indigenous peoples. Um, he was a worthy missionary that was spreading the ideals of Christianity amongst his tribe, and um, he was noted as a uh, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. But basically, he was viewed as the idea of a good Indian. Um, but besides this, and besides very brief records of Ogons that are just stories and no evidence, there is not much, if any, information online about who he truly was or what he actually looked like. So, Jay Cook then, why did he name his estate Ogons estate? Um, in his late 70s and early 80s, he wrote memoirs about his life stories, and one in one of the memoirs, he states, at my birth in a town called a town named called Sandusky, the place was frequently overrun with Indians. Old Ogans did himself and us the honor of occasionally sojourning for a few days on the spot where he had once dwelt in his wingwam. On such occasions, he was allowed to camp in our barn, and my mother fed him bountifully at the kitchen table. I was his favorite and occasionally was mounted on his shoulders for a ride. Um, because of this, and because of the fact that he named the school, his estate, Ogons Estate, there were other places in Sandusky that started to be named Ogons, other businesses, local institutions. Um, and this ended up coming into Philadelphia and places in Philadelphia were also being named Ogons because of his, his influence and him bringing the name over. However, whether or not that story is actually true is questionable because Jay Cook was born in 1821. 
Ovance presumably died either in 1812, 1812 or 1813. And um, in, a Firelands, in the Firelands Historical Society and its Board of Directors and Trustees, they had a meeting on, in Sandusky on October 10th in 1895. And Judge Sloan is on record saying, I want to say that there has been a good deal of misapprehension in regard to Ogons. I know that there is a school of that name in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia. I have seen an advertisement of that school, which speaks of its liberal founder, Mr. J. Cook, as having been a playmate of the chief Ogons, who was dead long before there was any white people living in this city. My father came here in 1817, Ogons was dead then, and our society records disclose the fact that he died in 1812. Um, and as well as that, there is a book that was published by Penn State Abington in This Time, This Place, that's what it's called. Um, and in it, there's a quote that states, the school has, in honor of Jay Cook, be named Penn State Ogons, and within the Sutherland building will be found a bust of Chief Ogons, the Native American storyteller Jay Cook claimed, in a possibly ap apocryphal story, to have hosted in his home many times as a boy. And it's worth noting that in a book that was published by Penn State Abington, they admit to the presumed idea that it may not have been true but they did not do anything to rectify the situation. So going more in depth with the school, we're gonna delve deeper into the race and gender. Um, I looked into the, oh, sorry. So there's a quote that specific, so Abby, Evis, sorry, I need to start over. Here we go. Abby A. Sutherland, the headmistress of the school who was um, in power from 1905 to 19, 1950 uh, to the end of the school time period, she wrote a book called The Hundred Years of Ogons. Um, and in the first chapter of the book, An Appreciation of the Private School, she states, the general state of mind of the students at the same economic level who can attend a private school is free from material anxiety and creates a happier atmosphere. The general prevalence of the same approach to religion, to social questions, to civic and political possibilities has a tendency to strengthen the mind and traditions of the best elements of the inherited common life. In a homogeneous group, there is a great sense of security which makes for individual strengthening and the best ideology of the class. Homogeneous taste and practice of good manners makes a very efficient and smooth way of life. So when you look into the physical examinations of the book, um, a physical examination book that was in the Ogons archives, um, they specifically had a segment in the, the medical records of each of each girl that was named nationality. And looking through the entire book, predominantly all of the, the countries that were listed were from European descent. Um, so, yes. And then as you go into gender of the school, um, uh, the, the Hundred Years of Ogans book that Abby Sutherland wrote, uh, she also states that the girl who grew more strengthened in good feminine taste and manners with a minimum of mental attainment seems sometimes more successful in life than the very gifted mental type who waves aside the wisdom of the conventional pattern. And on the, in the excerpt of the, of the newspaper of the school, they talk about a home economics class and this is seen on this, this, this slide here. And the excerpt states that in terms of taking home economics classes, it is the woman's part in the marriage partnership to know how to consume that which the man produces. So segueing from this idea of a homogeneous race, um, of uh, an all-American stay-at-home wife household, we have to go into the religious and Eurocentric curriculums of the school itself. Um, each student was required to take a Bible course at least once per year. And there was a compulsory weekly Sunday prayer that parents would sign off on, on which church the, the girl was allowed to go to. As well as this, there was a prioritization of Christian teachings over academic success. And Abby Sutherland wrote a book of prayers and devotions for the Ogon School. And in this book, there is a prayer for Columbus Day. And a specific quote from this prayer is, fire us with the zeal of Discovery Day to play the brave Columbus role for our own undiscovered powers. Um, sorry, blanked out. 
Um, so you're in in these quotes and in these these ideas that were taught within the school. Um, Christian character was speaking to a colonial culture where there was a need for European tradition as a means of improvement of other cultural backgrounds. Um, Eurocentric ideas, the idea of being Christian, white, homogeneous, all these were being taught to the girls as what is right and anything else is what is wrong. Um, also looking at the curriculums of the school, many of the, the, the classes were predominantly Eurocentric. Um, the, the languages that they were taught, they were German, French, uh, sorry, yeah, you get, you get what I mean. Um, so, sorry, I have a lot on my, I have a lot with me. So now going into the national of the, and the, the nationalism of the school that was, that was taught to the girls. Um, they were, they had to do these, these military drills. Uh, it was part of their, their exercise. Um, it was for proper posture. It was for teamwork and it was written as a sport. Um, the hidden teachings, however, of these military drills was nationalism, democracy, and conformity. Um, this was taught in a time where white men with elite wealth and colonial backgrounds held the most power. And the white nationalistic education to women of the same ethnic backgrounds equates to setting up the ability for all white elites to control all parts of society. Um, these girls were taught that they could not stand out of line when they were in these military drills. Um, they could not be an outlier of the collective. There was no trends, there was no unconventionality, and there was no challenging to the authority. Otherwise, they would bring shame onto the rest of the group. Um, this was colonial nationalism at its, at its peak. And it was during a time where there was a lot of development of the United States into being a place where there was nationalism in order to have pride in their own country. Um, but this speaks to what we see today as white superiority and white supremacy, especially given the fact that they were taught that going to the school meant that they had to be homogeneous, they had to fit under a certain Eurocentric lens, and that was all that they could be, and they could not stray from that. So I would like to go into the parts of colonization that are really predominant within the school. So here is um, the book of 1916 class. Um, they are here dressed as what they call Aztecs or what they view as Aztecs and talking about these minstrel shows because they had they, they had multiple minstrel shows actually, but this was just one example that I thought was important to mention. And um, they describe it as the seniors dressed in fanciful red and green Mexican costumes and singing to that mystic and lovely air of La Paloma danced in upon the audience. They had laid aside their accustomed dignity and impersonated to the fullest the irresponsible spirit of the Aztecs. It was impossible to believe that the swarthy seniors and daring senoritas whose smiles and laughter mingled with the jingling tambourines and clicking castanets were the quiet, dignified senior maidens. The impersonations were truer than truth and none called for explanation. So that was one example of what they did. Oh, and in the audience as well, um, in, in many of these mental shows, whenever you read about the audience's reaction, they were prominently laughing, um, finding enjoyment out of it, um, shocked that these girls could be any less dignified. Um, that kind of that kind of vibe. So, um, colonization with mascotting of Ogans himself. Um, there was one specific incident of the school where uh, they were taught to learn about their European heritages. So they got pictures that were related to their, their last names and their, their, own, their own family backgrounds and heritage. Um, and they learned about it in a, in a group setting. They talked to each other about it. They had, they had fun, um, they had a conversation. And to commemorate the final part of the event, they all ate a chocolate medallion that had a picture of what they called Chief Ogons on it, um, and they all ate it together in solidarity. As well as this, any of the stamps that were on um, report cards, that were on letters, um, they all had a picture of this, this image that they had of, of Chief Ogons um, in class rings, in pins, 
in the um in like even even down to like teacups uh they have just a picture of chief ogons like like stamped into it um in the ogons archival room this is this is what it brings to like like today what we see today um there is a statue of um what we could call an american indian um is it accurate no uh but it is just there solely for the fact that uh chief ogans was viewed as an american indian and therefore it fit the vibe of the rest of the room um as well as that, on the Sullivan Building, on the front entrance, when it was first built, there was a bas relief of what they viewed as Chief Ogons, and um, it is still standing there today on on the front of the building. It has not been removed. There has not been any comments on it. It's just there. Um, on the Penn State Abington Library website, um, they they have a collection about the Ogons School within its archives, and just a just a brief summary of of what the Ogons School was. Um, and when it was on a page of the relationship between Cook and Chief Ogons, it states some question arises as to whether Cook actually knew the historic Chief Ogons, whose life is legendary. He probably did. And the statement he probably did shows a complete lack of awareness. There's, there's ignorance in the fact that they don't really want to spend time researching or actually send any accurate information about the history of the school.